Welcome back to the second part of our interview with Courtney Brown of the Foresight Institute. I'm Randy Moggins. This is Off Planet Radio. And uh, on the last segment, you heard us talk at length of the Foresight Institute's uh, global climate change project from 2008 to 2012. And on this segment, we're going to look at uh, their current project, which is very interesting, very close to my heart. We're going to talk about the real story behind Atlantis and remote viewing the ancient civilization. Welcome back, Courtney Brown. Well, thank you again, and this is great being here, and I'm really glad we're having a chance to talk about Atlantis because that's something, we really have something new to tell about. You know, the Atlantean story has been around for a long while, and it's legendary, and it's mythology, and there, there's really very few hard understandings of what it actually is. Uh, people say it's this, it's that, but no one's really had any hard data of where it is, um, what they were doing, what the level of technology was. They point to these ruins that are under the water or those ruins that are under the water. So we're in a similar situation, meaning we have investigated some underwater anomalies and we're in the same situation of being able to say, I can't definitively say that this is Atlantis, but it fits the general parameters that are there in the legends, which is a technologically advanced society that destroyed itself. No, moreover, that destroyed itself by digging. So this, we found that, and after all of the remote viewing was done for it, I decided to call it the Atlantis Project because the word fit and it was easier to use a single word that conveyed a lot of knowledge than to say underwater anomalies of ancient advanced civilization on Earth. <laughs> so yeah. the word Atlantis was sort of a, a marketing issue. So did but you I'm set a, out to remote view Atlantis specifically or did no, you have targets? No. We had targets. In fact, if you go to our homepage, www.farsight, that's F-A-R-S-I-G-H-T, like seeing far, .org, O-R-G, because we're a nonprofit. Click on the third link in the nav bar, which says Atlantis. You will see the actual, you'll see the data page and links to all the remote viewing sessions. And you'll see scrolling down the actual targets. Now, they're Google Earth targets. And one of them is we call the Atlantic Grid. And it's 1,000 miles west of Portugal and Morocco, a, a three miles deep in the water. And it looks like a dead ringer for the ruins of an ancient civilization. Uh, it, it looks like a, a huge city, one third or one quarter the size of Portugal, uh, with uh, you know grid marks that are a dead ringer for an ancient civilization. And the other one, if you go further down the page, is what we call the Antarctic grid, which looks like a checkerboard pattern of holes on the ground, things holes that were dug right off the coast of Antarctica, and clearly artificial. And so. Looking at those two anomalies, I said, you know, we should just find out what those are. So I started a project, and all of the projects that we do are done totally blind, meaning the remote viewers are never told anything about the target. They just said, there's a target, remote view it, send me the session. And we developed, I developed three versions of targets to go with these, these, with these Google Earth images. And the first one was, uh, what is there on the bottom of the ocean right now? What is that? Mm -hmm. Second was, what was that thing in its prime before it was on the ocean, on the bottom of the ocean? And then the third thing was, what did it look like at the moment it was sinking? <laughs> Meaning when it started to go into the water, what was happening? So we went into those things with that in mind to unravel this story. And the word Atlantis was nowhere in our vocabulary. We were just looking at these anomalies on Google Earth. Mm -hmm. And the sessions started to come in. And our projects typically take a minimum of two years to do. Uh, the remote viewing takes usually a year or more than the, um, the preparation for the remote viewing takes months. Then the analysis and video production afterwards takes sometimes a year. <laughs> we're all volunteer organizations. So. Mm -hmm. so anyway, while we were doing this, uh, and we started in 2011, while we were doing this, 
at the end of uh, the remote viewing process, when the sessions were almost finished, Google Earth announced Google Earth 2.0 of underwater imagery. And as you can imagine, most of the anomalies were not completely eliminated, but most of them were gone. With regard to the first version of the uh, anomalies, some oceanographers were stating that these were ship tracks. Now, I know ship tracks. And I said to myself, in my opinion, that's crazy to call those things ship tracks. Ship tracks are like railroad tracks. They're two exactly parallel lines. And they're made be, as an imaging artifact when the ships that you use sonar to read the bottom of the oceans don't go in overlapping parallel paths and cover a large area of the bottom. They just go off in one direction. And so the sonar directly underneath the ship is really high resolution, very clear. And off to the sides, you get really fuzzy, really fuzzy imagery. So it looks like two railroad tracks with everything in the middle being really clear and everything outside of those two parallel lines being really fuzzy. Mm -hmm. And this anomaly on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, 1,000 miles west of Morocco and Portugal, that doesn't look at all like ship tracks, in my opinion. So I looked at that and I said, I, I don't care how authoritative those people are. I don't, take, I don't believe it. It's just not the way it is. Though I want to find out what that thing is. And then Google Earth 2.0 came out, and the anomalies were not entirely erased, but mostly erased. And oceanographers came out and said, see, everything's been fixed now. The anomalies go away. So I looked at it and I said, nothing's been fixed at all. First of all, the anomalies are still partially visible, but the, what happened is very clear. I work with imagery and video all the time, and what's happened is extreme high compression algorithms were applied to the ocean bottom data, especially in those areas, and this high compression wiped out the color gradients. So what happens with all Google Earth imagery, raw file sizes are enormous, and they have to use compressed images in order to make Google Earth a viable product. Right, right. So these images were compressed, of course, but if they're over compressed, you don't see anything. It's all one color. For example, if you have your picture of Aunt Matilda, you see her hair color, her hat color, her face color, her lips color, her dress color, and it's all different so you can see the picture. If you keep compressing it and compressing it and compressing it, you're not going to see Aunt Matilda anymore. You'll just get one blob of gray. Right. And so that's what it is. And the telltale sign is if you look at the same spots on the, on the Google Earth imagery of 2.0, you'll see large patches that follow the pixel lines vertically, upward and inward, and sideways, that have the exact same color. And if you translate this into grayscale, you can actually see it that you have one shade of gray. So the, the, the pictures have been processed using extreme compression, and that's the only thing that happened. Now, I am not saying, and this is very important, I am not saying that any ocean, oceanographer, scientist, or institution, or group, or anything, you know, conspired to corrupt the Google Earth data. I am not saying that. What I'm saying is these are governmental data. The ships that actually collected these data were under contract by the United States Navy. And the U.S. government can do anything it wants with these data before any oceanographer, scientist, or anybody else gets their hand on it. Mm -hmm. So these are governmental data. And I am simply saying that I personally do not believe any image at face value or any authoritative statement about any image at face value. Even teenage photoshoppers can do Hollywood magic right, right. With, yeah. with images. So we have to find another way to find out the truth. If these are ship tracks, oh, and by the way, when the second images came out, um, not only were things not fixed, in my opinion, but the old stories about ship tracks totally went away, almost as if they never happened. It was like, you know, and I said, well, I didn't believe the first dismissal. Now I don't <laughs> believe the second one either. Now I'm not saying that the people are not sincere. I'm just saying that I don't take anything at face value, especially authoritative statements. And so I said, let's find out for real what happened. In the Antarctic grid, that checkerboard pattern of holes, that anomaly is still visible, although it's diminished because of the compression issues once again. 
So compression, overcompression smooths the bottom, but that's exactly what we don't want to do. We don't want to smooth the bottom. Since, those, since the original artifacts weren't ship tracks in the first place, in my opinion, I think it's any idiot can see that. Any idiot that knows really what ship tracks look like can look to, in my opinion, and say, those are not ship tracks. I mean, ship tracks have such a characteristic, classic, that's what they are. Mm -hmm. That anomaly on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean doesn't, in my opinion, even come close. So the lines are not straight. They're not two par they're not two parallel lines with clear stuff in the middle and fuzzy stuff outside. They're not straight. They don't look at ship like ship tracks at all. It looks like stuff that's buried in sediment. And, and anyway, so we started out by having the remote doors do this thing. And then the stuff came in. The actual results came in. And it was after the results started coming in that I said, you know, this is gonna be very difficult to describe to people. So we have to call it something. We have to like, it's, it's, a, it's a marketing issue. How can you tell something, give people the most information with the fewest words? And so I said, well, the word Atlantis does convey what we got. So Randy, let me just sort of summarize what we found. And let me also say that all of the remote viewing data are available for free on the, our, on the Parsite's website, and you can see the sessions. But we also have a DVD that we just came out with, which I strongly encourage people to watch and to show their friends and to bring their family and relatives over, get the word out if you get the DVD. Uh, it's, it not only helps us do the next project and keeps us afloat, we don't have any National Science Foundation grants. We are completely audience supported. I mean, and so, uh, and this project is a little different than others because we decided to pay our viewers. There were seven targets totally and we, decided to pay them $100 per target. They did multiple sessions for each target. Mm -hmm. Now that's a very small amount of money given the amount of work that they did and, and their capabilities. But we wanted to establish a principle of paying the viewers in hopes that that would encourage more people to learn remote viewing and to get good at it. Not just by taking a week a course in it and practicing it for a month or two, but to get really good at it. So. Even when people do artwork, they study art for years and go to art college and so on like that, not because they just are having fun. They do it because they're hoping to have some source of income with this art that they do eventually. Mm -hmm. Even if, I mean, that's if they're doing it seriously as compared to just dabbling in it. And so if we pay the remote viewers, it might encourage more people. We have less than 10 people on the planet right now that are capable of doing this type of stuff at this level. This is after teaching it for like 18 years to thousands of people. You have less than 10. And that's because these are the people that took it up as a hobby with no expectations of being paid for anything. There are very few people who are willing to dedicate that much for no you know, financial whatever. Yeah. And so we, de we decided to say, let's try paying them. They would have gladly done it without, without being paid. But we have to get through this bottleneck. We have to get more people doing remote viewing and being serious about it. So if we can establish a, a situation where we paid them, so in this case, they each get paid $700 for this project, $1,400 total. Uh, the DVD literally supports that. We have not yet sold enough DVDs to have $1,400 to do that, but um, nonetheless, uh, that's the principle. So the, when people buy the DVD, not only are you getting a complete description of what actually happened in the society, you're getting really value that you can't get at the universities or any other place, but you're also helping us to keep doing this and to encourage more people to, to uh, um, support the projects that we're doing and have more projects in the future. So anyway, but the, basically what we found is as follows. The society that was there, the two locations that were there, the area that was a thousand miles west of Portugal, Morocco, and three miles deep, that was a living environment. That was a city. It was a huge area, but it was like an urban environment. Think of a very large version of New York City. Now, the, the society overall was about a hundred years more advanced technologically than we are today. So we are very close to what they used to be. And that society 
had architecture that was in that area, a lot like the older architecture that we have in New York City, such as Penn Station, Grand Central Station, mm -hmm. a lot of, of vaulted ceilings, arches, um, but plus they had a lot of, you know, escalators, uh, moving sidewalks. They had, think of New York City in rush hour w during the 1940s and 50s. That's sort right. of what it looked okay. like. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Now, the Antarctic region, that, we call it the Antarctic grid, that was different. That was a military industrial mining complex. All those holes were actually mining that was going on. And they had buildings that were very recognizable to us today in the squarish architecture that we have today, in skyscrapers that are squarish. Mm -hmm. So they had buildings that had as many floors above ground as below ground. They had circular buildings that looked like towers. Um, imagine like a toilet paper tube type of shape or like some hotels are built in sort of uh, like a... a like a tube right, shape right, going yeah. up and down yeah. and with multiple floors above where you have a, a nice view and lots of floors down. So they had a lot of stuff of that type of architecture, plus a lot of squarish architecture with angular stuff. They didn't have the vaulted ceilings and the, uh, the old Penn Central type of architecture. That right. was more in the Atlantic area. So... It was the difference between what the, what the areas were used for. The one down near Antarctica was a military industrial, mostly industrial, but with some military overlap, scientific um, concept. And, and then it, it wasn't a living environment, it was a work environment. And they were, the, interestingly, just by chance, they were actually controlling an experiment. And it was secrecy cloak science. and. It was the people down in the Antarctic region that were actually controlling an experiment, and they were the ones who destroyed the whole place. And basically what was going on as follows. They had two, they had a source of energy that was crystalline in base. They had rockets, I mean, I'm sorry, they had reactors that were crystalline in base. They were very mm -hmm. clean source of energy, much cleaner than our nuclear reactors of today. And they could power their entire planet on it. However, they were also digging. They were going after the heat in the center of the Earth. They were digging. Now, our planet, this may seem strange, Randy, but our planet is not a good place for us to be on. It's a lousy place for a long-term civilization. We are on an 8,000-mile diameter ball of molten rock, and we have an 8-mile thick crust. That's crazy. Yeah. We have regular magnetic pole shifts, I'm not saying the Earth shifts and moves around. No, the, but the magnetic poles move around. And that plays havoc with volcanic stuff. We have, we have solar events, so-called Carrington-type events, but mass coronal, coronal mass ejections that would wipe out electricity anywhere. And, and according to Robert Schock, uh, let me see, I even have Robert Schock's book, Forbidden Civilization. Let me put it up for the camera yeah. so you can see. We're looking forward to getting Robert on the show as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's a, he's a, he's a, first, he's a Boston University professor, and uh, it's S-C-H-O-C-H, -H, but it's pronounced shock. And he's written the book, Forgotten Civilization, where he documents major civilizations that date back uh, 10, 12,000 years using carbon-14 data. So the stuff you learn in the university about civilization starting 3,000 years ago is just completely idiotic. We have really good, solid evidence that goes beyond that. However, uh, he only stops at like 10, 12,000 years. The Atlantis thing, we have good information saying that that was 70,000 years. But if you look at other people, such as Michael Cremo's book, Forbidden Archaeology, for example. Michael right, Cremo right. is, doc you can see how fat this book is, is an extremely well-documented book. He details archaeological data that simply mainstream archaeologists refuse to look at. It's one of the situations of they're willing to look at only the dots they want to connect. All the other dots that don't fit their, their pictures, they, re, they, they just won't look at. But it's very clear from the archaeological evidence that human beings have lived here at the same time uh, it, concurrently with apes going back millions of years. And so what we have is a situation in which we have had civilizations rise and fall on this planet. 
And historically, even if you go back just a couple hundred years, it's very difficult to keep evidence of what exactly happened, even only a couple hundred years ago. When you go three, yes. four, five thousand years, it's almost impossible. And so this is a situation where we had a major technological society that went belly up. And basically what happened was that they were digging, and we know where they were digging also. It was in the area near Australia. And the, the incident in mainstream science is often referred to as the Toba Catastrophe Theory. That's T-O-B-A, Tango, Oscar, Bravo, Alpha. So, and that refers to Lake Toba in Indonesia. I don't think they got the, right, the name right, the, the place right. That's not exactly where the digging occurred, but it's close. And the, what they basically were doing is they were digging through the crust. Now, this is the last thing you want to do. They knew it was risky, but it was secrecy cloak science, the same as us today. These are our ancestors. We're repeating history. Whether we're building unsafe nuclear power plants like Fukushima Daiichi or all other nuclear power plants with spent fuel rods and swimming pools on the grounds, uh, or if we're dealing with genetically modified foods, um, no matter what we do, we do it in a secrecy cloaked way. And what, we basic, what they basically had was they were digging uh, with these tunneling apparatuses trying to get to the heat, trying to get to the, to the lava underneath. Now, when you see a volcano blow, it's basically lava that squeaks up through the cracks and eventually over many years builds up pressure and then in a pocket pops, mm -hmm. sort of like a pimple that pops. Well, they weren't doing that. They were drilling really wide diameter holes straight through the crust into the lava. Well, they had flat panel computer monitors, offices, looked like a NASA interior you know, office stuff. And they were watching it, and they actually saw that their experiment was gone bonkers. And they saw the reaction taking place, and saw it was uncontrolled, and it was destroying the machine, and the lava was beginning to come up. And it looks like they had about five days to warn everybody. They had, an, a pre, they had a civilian authority, like a president. Mm -hmm. The military took the president and his advisors and led them to what they thought was a secure bunker. They had throngs of people, literally thousands of people, coming to the streets where they were addressing them in loudspeakers, telling them what had happened. They, they knew it was an, a possible extinction-level event. The people behind the computer monitors didn't know whether to laugh or to cry, and some of them started to pray for the first time because they could see what was going on. And then what happened was it pumped. It blew a hole in the side of the planet, you know, comparable to a good chunk of Australia. The plume looked like a nuclear explosion was visible, you know, over half the planet. It was huge. And it created a vacuum, of course, in Inside the planet in other areas. And really, let me give you an idea. Let me show you. When these types of things happen, here's a globe. When these types of things happen, they'll happen in one spot, and the reaction is going to be in the antipode. That will mean if it happens in one spot, you look at the exact opposite so, spot yes. on the planet. Yeah. And that's where it that's where the reaction will occur. So when we look at the Atlantis anomaly, the Atlantic grid anomaly, the large civilization that sunk, they were not doing the experiment. They were, that was a living environment, uh, living, working, like a city. They sunk. So how do you find where the explosion was? You start with them. And in this case, I'm going to, you know, off the coast of Europe and looking at the exact spot that's opposite. Well, it's the ocean area around, between, off, of, off the coast of Sydney and between Sydney and New Zealand in that area. Mm -hmm. So we're talking sort of that area and you might call that the Admiralty Islands or the Admiralty area. So it's in the ocean to the east of Sydney uh, including and a little past around that area of New Zealand. Now, that's not very far away from Indonesia, which is why mainstream scientists said it must have been Lake Toba. They'd had, they, it can't be, Lake Toba itself was a volcano, of course, but that, 
that was a normal volcano. They, mm -hmm. Normal volcanoes, even the mainstream scientists say normal volcanoes can't have done what happened 70,000 years ago. Whatever happened 70,000 years ago was a huge thing, creating a nuclear nightmare and so on. So why do we suspect that that's the place? Because it is the antipode for the spot that sunk um, a thousand miles west of Morocco and Portugal. And also, it's the largest concentration of volcanic, uh, gray volcanic matter anywhere on the planet. It's also a very thin spot in the crust. So there's all evidence that that is the spot that popped, including being the antipode of the place that sunk. And um, basically, why do we know it was 70,000 years ago? Because mainstream scientists, you can look up tuba catastrophe theory in Wikipedia, for example, and see the debates about it. Mainstream scientists know from the genetic evidence that it was 70,000 years ago that a huge unprecedented volcanic event occurred and it killed off everybody on the planet, all humans, except for two to six thousand, eight thousand surviving pairs of people. Mm -hmm. That means there may have been more survivors, but they weren't having babies. So among the babies producing people, there were two, six, eight thousand, ten thousand pairs of people. And everyone on the planet today is a descendant, whether you're Aboriginal, Caucasian, European, African, Native American, or whatever, Asian, you're, we're all descendants of the same two, four, six, eight thousand pairs of people that survived the nuclear, the, the, um, the volcanic holocaust of 70,000 years ago. So that's why we connect it to that date. It's because what we see with remote viewing matches what the mainstream scientists are say, saying happened 70,000 years ago with that level. We're seeing an explosion in the same area that we're looking at. We're looking at an explosion in the exact same area because it's the antipode of the Atlantic grid target. And we're seeing a description that matches exactly what they're saying happened. The only big difference is we're saying it was a human-created volcanic event, not a natural volcanic event. And they, mainstream scientists don't know of any way a natural volcanic event of that magnitude could have happened. And the reason they don't know is because it didn't happen that way. It was a man-made one. So they had about five days warning, it looks like, from the remote viewing data. And what they did with those five days is to announce to everybody that they screwed up, that it was going to happen. And they tried to organize some rescue stuff. They knew that they knew where it happened. They actually knew where the explosion happened, of course or was going to happen, and they knew what area was going to sink. That's mm -hmm. the interesting thing, mm -hmm. because in that area, the part that did sink, because it was the antipode, they knew when you blow out one side, it'll be the exact opposite side that'll sink in. Right. They actually managed to organize some rescue attempts where people were led to boats to get onto boats in preparation for the inundation. And they knew the land would sink, and when it sunk, you need a boat. And what they tried to do, they knew it was a potential extinction level event, they put women on the boats. And they weren't just any women, they were pregnant, childbearing, capable of childbearing uh, um, women, not old women. They were women that were capable of giving birth. And the few men that they put on the boats were only used to sail the boats. And they actually managed to organize a little bit of that. And possibly because of that, we are here today. We don't know exactly, you know, who's, you know, exactly who survived, whether they're peoples, you know, up, up, up on some mountains or if they were the boat mm -hmm. people. But there were just a few thousand people that survived. The president or the civilian leader, the scientists who did the experiment, all the military industrial complex, they all died. So one of the lessons that we want to learn, you know, and they were trying to hide in bunkers. There were no safe bunkers. This planet cannot protect you when something like that happens. This planet is a really bad place. The only eventual future for humanity is to leave the planet. So a thousand years from now, I can see us emptying this planet. The only thing this planet should be used for, and I think probably we'll eventually find out that this planet was designed to be used in this way, 
it should be only a botanical and zoological garden, Play, mm -hmm. perhaps a place to visit. But the long-term civilization, you need a million years of uninterrupted progress. You can't grind us down to a pulp every few thousand years <laughs> and expect civilization yeah. to occur. Now, just by luck, the Atlantean civilization had enough time to, you know, have a technology that was a technological level of technological development that was about a hundred years more advanced to, than us. So, um, they must have had literally a throw of the dice, a period of time where they were able to advance without being crushed by other sources. But if you read Robert Schock's book, you'll see that the other societies that that rise up don't get to that level of technology before they're crushed by natural events. Either it's a coronal mass ejection that is horrific. For so, for example, if you look at the ruins in Turkey, Göbekli Tepe, yes, where it's a huge of hundreds of thousands, you know, I mean, no, I mean hundreds of acres of uh, very major structures, uh, stone structures, uh, very advanced, at least as advanced in, in architecture as the building of the pyramids. They were purposely buried 10, 12,000 years ago by the people that were living there. And this is a huge site. And this is, you know, when, so when modern archaeologists say civilization started 3,000 years ago, they're ignoring sites ignoring sites like Gobekli Tepe, and you don't have to take people's word for it. You can hop on a plane and go there. I mean, Gobekli Tepe is huge. It's, the infrastructure is, is, is just now being excavated, but, it's yes, all of, yes. but a lot of it is. And the carbon dating is absolutely unambiguous. It goes back like 10,000, 12,000 years. So the question is, why were they burying themselves? They were cutting themselves. It was not covered up by a, a natural disaster. It was humans who covered it up. They were living, they covered up the structures so that they could live inside it, underground. That seems to suggest that something was happening with the sun that was, you know, raining hell on earth <laughs> down. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't happen every couple hundred years, but if you go periods of like 10,000 years, you know, these types of things regularly happen. We have a very thick atmosphere. The, the weather is really bad. I mean, Hurricane Sandy. This is a very tough planet to live. And uh, historical archaeological data seems to suggest that usually, on average, societies don't have more than 10 or 12,000 years before they get pummeled back to nothing. Atlantean society, the technological development of that place was different. They, by chance, had a long period of time, and they and but they killed themselves off, and then we've gone. Well, that's to the important life. takeaway that I wanted to parallel as we close out here is that <clears throat> there's some ominous parallel between this story and what we are doing on this planet now. Um, yes, I know one of the concerns and one of the things we're going to talk about in this show in the very near future is fracking and what we're doing in pulling out. Um, <clears throat> All of these mineral deposits out of the ground, whether it's uh, deep oil, w deep oil wells in the Gulf, or fracking on the mainland, and we're doing it all over the world right now. And I think what you just discussed is an important way to get the message out that we need to pay attention to this ancient history, lest yeah. our own peril come upon us again. Now, mind you, Randy, I am a scientist, so I'm all in favor <laughs> of science. What I am opposed to is secrecy cloaked science yeah. Yeah. because we are now at the level of development in which we can really do bad things to the planet. We can really screw it up. We, when we were running around with sticks and stones, there wasn't much we could do. But with high technology, we can do it. Now, scientists and the powers that be don't like sort of public experiments because that invites prying eyes, ignorant masses, asking crazy questions, bureaucratic oversight, bureaucratic excess, and slowdown of progress. Mm -hmm. All right. It does imply, it does imply all that. They're correct. But when you get to the level of technological development that we have, there is no alternative. You have to include as part of your operating expenses the education of the masses. You have to bring them along with you, and you have to get them involved in the decision-making process of whether the experiment should be allowed to proceed. 
I know that the powers that be don't want that, but we should learn from our mistakes of the past. The powers that be themselves died. Everybody died. The yes. scientists died. Everybody died. Yep. There is no escape from this. You have to accept the idea that there is responsibilities when you do risky things. And scientists and powers that be are cocky. They think they can get away with it. But the reality is they can't. And for their own good as well as everybody else's own good, the idea of doing secrecy cloak science really has to give way to public involvement. And that means ramping up an entire infrastructure of learning how to talk to the public and educate the public and get the public involved in, 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 in understanding stuff. And it does mean sometimes slowing down of certain things. But right now we're in a situation where secrecy cloak science and industry built nuclear power plants all over the planet, including Fukushima Daiichi. And Fukushima Daiichi is not unusual. It's just like all the other power plants. I live it's, 10 miles from Three Mile Island, right outside right, right there. Window. Yeah. And in every one of those plants, there's a swimming pool. And the swimming pool holds all the spent nuclear rods, and they have nowhere else to put them. They can't even put them into a space shuttle and throw them into the sun, because if even one of the space shuttles blew up, all life on Earth dies, because yeah. it has plutonium in it. Yeah. So the, re the thing is, if we were to experience a coronal mass ejection, which we are going to do, like mm -hmm. the one that happened in 1859, that is going to happen. It's not a matter of remote viewing. It's just a matter of statistics. You can't go another thousand years without it's going to happen. So it's going to happen. And when it does happen, and it may happen, we're long, we're long overdue, so it may happen sooner rather than later, the power goes out. And when the power goes out, the cooling pumps for the nuclear reactors shuts down. Mm -hmm. And then you're talking only days before the water in, the, in those pools is dry, and you have a Fukushima type of situation times 10,000 all over the planet. So, you know, industry and mainstream scientists and so on laughed at everybody. Oh, you're, you're, you don't understand science. You're just screwy. You're just, you're crazy people. You yeah. don't, let us do what we need to do. We'll power up everything. And electricity will be cheap and it'll be great. We know what we're doing. But the reality is we are in a very difficult situation right now because of that type of secrecy cloak stuff. So the end of secrecy cloak science means a change in the way we do things. Doesn't mean that we're going to stop doing science, but public involvement in science is the only way we can go forward. I must say that we do public experiments and remote viewing here at the Farsight Institute, and we get tons of misunderstanding of what we're doing. People misunderstood our results, for example, with our climate project, which was a spot-on, absolutely great project, very successful. But people were looking at the details and not understanding that we were predicting major things, but we were not predicting the details to be correct. We were looking at multiple timelines. They didn't understand the multiple timeline issue. We had to explain it and explain it. And after we explained it, they came back with the same questions as if they never heard us. And then we have to explain it again and explain it again. So that's what happens when you involve the public with complicated science issues. That's going to continue happening. And it's got to be part of doing science. It's not something you run away from, especially when you have the capability of destroying the planet. And here we have perfect archaeological evidence, solid Google Earth pictures, pictures you just can't walk away from, solid remote viewing data that matches it, recreates it. And by the way, on the DVD, we have a live session by Dick Algar, one of the great remote viewers on the yes. planet. Dick Algar and Doug, Deborah Duggan Takagi are the two remote viewers in the project. And he has a live session where he does, under totally blind conditions, the target, what's there now. And he describes it, and you can see him so like, what in the world is this? And he says, it's on the bottom of the ocean. Boy, this is a lot of pressure down here, tremendous pressure. What's this huge set of structures underneath the sediment? fused into the bedrock. You couldn't build this thing with a submarine. Who built this thing? What? And he, he's going through the whole thing, and you see it all live, and you sort of realize what the remote viewing process is like, but mm -hmm. you also see it in a way that almost makes you fall off of your chair. Uh, it's, it's, the DVD is an education in itself. Anyway, I, I tell I people, recommend well, people. talk about the DVD and tell the folks where they can find it and the details you want to put out on that, Courtney. Uh, sure, it's very clear. It's, you, can, you can get access to it just by going to our website, which is farsight.org, 
We sell it on Amazon, of course. And right on our homepage, there's a, a second banner down. It says, uh, Atlantis, the true story. Click on that, and you can actually see the first 15 minutes of the DVD for free right there, uh, right on the web page. And also, if you click on Atlantis and the nav bar, there's a Watch Now button that you'll see pop up, and you can get to that same page where you can see the first 15 minutes of the DVD there. But the actual DVD has... It's, it's, it's an unprecedented DVD where you get a major project, and we always have verifiable stuff in our projects, such as the Google Earth imagery. You can't walk away from that. And then similarly, we have um, a live session on there. That, so, and and you literally, you learn something about the history of our planet that you literally cannot get, that you cannot get in any other source. So uh, anyway, you can't get it at the universities, you can't get it anywhere, so this is the place. By the way, this also tells people why uh, what you're doing, Randy, is so important. You're acting as a venue for people to get information that they can't get through mainstream sources. They cannot get it through CNN, New York Times, any university, anywhere in the country, or anywhere in the world. So this is, you know, people, when they support your efforts as well, they're supporting a future for humanity that is much different and really important. Yeah. I think we share those objectives and those goals as well, Courtney, and that's why it's always so much fun to catch up with you and talk to you about the latest things going on. Uh, one more time going out, the website uh, for uh, Farsight Institute is farsight.org, is that correct? Yeah, .org, O-R-G, because we are a non-profit, F-A-R-S-I-G-H-T, like seeingfar.org, farsight.org. And of course, folks watching the video, you're going to see all these links pop up as well as the graphics as we go through it anyway, so with all the information in front of you. Courtney, thanks for coming on today, thanks for sharing, thanks for doing the video, and I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Great, and thank you so much for inviting me, Randy. My pleasure. This is Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. We'll be back again very soon. The truth is out there. It's inside you.